Pastor Alicia Reese says the church offers a variety of events and meetings, from grief counseling, AA meetings, and women's wellness groups, a space she emphasizes everyone is welcome regardless of their circumstances. She started the co at the congregation during the pandemic and shares there's one emotion people continue to battle with. Loneliness has kind of become almost a second pandemic, that people are lonely, they're looking for a community, they're looking for a place to be honest about everything that they're experiencing, um, whether it be grief, pain, the loss of a loved one, and more. And so we really want to be a place that says, welcome, you're welcome here to come um, as you are with what you have. But that has definitely been a huge need mm -hmm. in our community. And the pastor goes on by saying they will be coming together to see how they can help these families as they seek new opportunities. And coming up, we speak with the local mayor. But first, I send it back to you. Joanna, it'll be good to, to hear from the mayor later on. There's been a lot of talk about that this week, too. Thank you. And now to Paris with more on abortion access in Illinois. Paris. Brand is an Indiana law banning abortion at all stages of pregnancy with limited exceptions is now in effect. It comes 83 days after the U.S. Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade and makes Illinois an island of abortion access for people throughout the Midwest and the South. WTTW News reporter Heather Sharon joins us now with a look at what the near total ban in Indiana means for access in Chicago and across Illinois. So Heather, you spoke with representatives of groups across the state that uh, help people get access to abortion and other kinds of reproductive health care, including Alicia Hurtado from the Chicago uh, Abortion Fund. Let's listen to what she had to say. We know that with this Indiana ban coming down, that we're going to see many more Hoosiers coming to Illinois. We believe that these arbitrary state lines should not determine someone's access to abortion care, um, even though that's what our Supreme conservative justices on the Supreme Court and anti-abortion lawmakers are wanting our reality to be. So Heather, how are groups like the Chicago Abortion Fund preparing for this? Well, there's not a whole lot more they can do because every group I spoke with has been at capacity since the Dobbs decision came down from the United States Supreme Court. So these additional people who will be seeking reproductive health care in Illinois will only add to the stretched capacity that these groups are really struggling to deal with. And whether they'll be able to keep up with that demand is a very open question. And one of the groups said not able to keep up with with this demand right now is the Midwest Access Coalition. They made the decision to limit the number of people it helps pay for transportation and lodging while they're in Illinois seeking an abortion. Uh, let's listen to what that group told you. This week, we really came together as an organization and tried to put caps on the amount of the amount of clients that we were seeing just because what we were doing was really at an unsustainable rate a lot of crying was involved um, but you know this was a decision that was a long time coming so why has the supreme court's dobbs decision made this so much more difficult on states like illinois where the laws haven't changed well, abortion access exists in an ecosystem. So if you limit the ability of people to get this care in states like Indiana and Missouri and Kentucky, you're going to increase the demand in Illinois. And as I heard over and over again, just because these procedures are now banned in those states, it has done nothing to lessen the demand from those people who need or want them. And that has really led to a situation where people in Illinois, where we We've all heard the reassurances from elected officials that nothing changed with the Dobbs decision. It means that people in Illinois are waiting significantly longer and are having a hard, harder time finding care. All right, right on the border of Illinois, you spoke with uh, someone from Planned Parenthood in the St. Louis region. She told you that uh, they were trying to plan for this worst case scenario, but still uh, they didn't know what was coming. Uh, they didn't know it was going to be this bad. Uh, let's take a look. When Indiana falls, we will see an influx of patients needing to flee their state for abortion care. Illinois is an island in a region surrounded by states with highly restrictive or banned um, or have banned abortion. So the St. Louis region includes the metro east uh, part of Illinois, uh, downstate Illinois. How is downstate or southern Illinois uh, dealt with this and is it different than uh, up here in Chicago? 
It is different. It's really the epicenter of the crisis because there are more clinics in Chicago than there are really anywhere else in Southern Illinois, which is asking, which is having to bear the burden of people coming from Texas, Arkansas, all over the South, not to mention Missouri. And in that St. Louis region facility operated by Planned Parenthood, wait times have increased to almost three weeks, up from three days before the Dodds decision. And there's been an 114 percent increase in the number of abortions performed past 14 weeks. And once you get to that point in a pregnancy, an abortion is more complicated and more costly, providing more hurdles for people see seeking this care. He Heather, we're, we're pretty much out of time, but I just want to ask you, Governor J.B. Pritzker called for a special session to deal with this, to ostensibly to put more resources towards some of this. What happened to that? Well, these are very difficult questions, and it wasn't clear what the Illinois legislature could do that would withstand a court challenge and get through a special session, which have special rules. And it's a very complicated issue, and perhaps in the veto session in November after the general election, we'll see some action on abortion then. Complicated issue, no uh, complicated answer. No, no easy answers here, uh, obviously. Heather, thanks very much. Thanks, Paris. And you can read Heather's full story on our website, wttw.com slash news. And now to Brandis for reaction to the verdict in the Chicago trial of R. Kelly. Brandis. Paris, thank you. Survivors of sexual assault might say it's been a long road. As a federal jury yesterday convicted singer R. Kelly of six counts of producing child pornography and enticing girls for sex. The singer faced similar charges 14 years ago but was acquitted even though the same video of him sexually assaulting a 14-year-old girl was critical to both trials. Here to talk about this and the impact of this verdict could have are Mallory Littlejohn, legal director at the Chicago Alliance Against Sexual Exploitation, Jim DeRogatis, music journalist and the first to report on R. Kelly's abuse back in 2000. DeRogatis first received that infamous video at the center of the trial, and Shahrazad Tillett, co-founder and executive director of A Long Walk Home. That's an organization that aims to empower young people to end violence against girls and women. Tillett was also a consultant for the Lifetime documentary Surviving R. Kelly. Everyone, thank you for joining us. So let's go over this verdict. Kelly was found guilty on three counts of child pornography, three counts of enticing a minor into sexual activity. He was found not guilty on seven other counts. Jim DeRogatis, you've covered this for quite some time, as we've said. What's your reaction to this verdict? Um, it, it was anger. I think that the uh, federal government put on a very sloppy case. They did not do their homework. They did not read 22 years of my reporting in the Sun-Times or BuzzFeed or the New Yorker or my book. The loose ends in this case, uh, the enablers uh, being acquitted, I don't understand how. Uh, the travesty of justice in 2008 in Judge Vincent Gohan's courtroom, uh, the acquittal on this victim. Uh, now he's convicted on this victim and, and, and several of her underage friends for that uh, it encounters that he taped on three videos. Um, if he's guilty of that, how was there not a conspiracy to rig the trial in 2008? There damn well was. It's a black mark on Chicago history, like the Black Sox scandal or Al Capone. And Chicago still hasn't come to terms to that. And the reason it matters is my, my two fellow guests tonight, because the community was devastated by this predator for 30 years. And, and, uh, and, and Chicago must answer to that. And let's get into that a little bit more. Shahrazad Tillett, what does this verdict mean for the women who've been abused by R. Kelly? Yeah, I mean, I think this verdict is bittersweet, like Jim said. Um, one, that it's been a long, long time coming. Specifically, I always call this case like one of the most important cases that we have around black women and girls. And the fact that it has taken this long for some type of justice um, says a lot about how we think in our society about black girls as victims. Um, and this reckoning that has happened, um, having this case, particularly this federal case happening in Chicago where the sites of the trauma has happened, where so much of the bystanders and the, the, the conspiracies have, have happened and where this tape, original tape has, has was produced, um, 
I think that it was really important what this case produced because um, it, it allowed some type of justice for the bravery of some of those survivors that came forward, right? Um, and allowing maybe a healing to happen um, to the city of Chicago. Mallory Littlejohn, same question to you. Uh, you know, six out of 13 counts here, uh, you know, and having heard, uh, you know, both sides are kind of claiming some level of victory here. What does this mean uh, for survivors of sexual abuse? Jahara Zaid, I just have to echo that it is absolutely bittersweet. Black women and girls are so often disbelieved. Um, we are the last to be listened to. We do not often get accountability. And you see both of those things unfolding here. You see women finally being listened to and finally being believed, but you also see a lack of accountability in terms of the counts where there were not guilties or the defendants where there were not guilties. Um, Sadly, I am not surprised by that, and I think nobody on this call is also surprised by that. Jim, you wrote last year that New York, that Kelly's New York trial left open the question of how he avoided conviction back in 2008. Uh, mm -hmm. And it sounds like with, you know, with his two co-defendants being acquitted, you probably don't feel like this case answered that question, and I think you hoped it would. Yeah, I really did. I mean, the feds uh, in Chicago went after two uh, dubious characters who Kelly hired to get other tapes off the street. But how did the judicial system fail? Kelly's attorney, who is now deceased, Ed Jensen, said on his deathbed he was guilty as hell. And, you know, Daryl McDavid kept bringing up, I was just telling, doing what Eddie Jensen told me to do. I was just doing what Gerald Margolis told me to do. And Jack Palladino, the private investigator, all three of those men are dead. But on his deathbed, Jensen said we all knew Kelly was guilty in 2008. Judge Gawne has never been held to account for six years of, uh, of pre-trial hearings in which he consistently ruled for the defense. And all of those records are sealed. Uh, Jive Records, Clive Calder and Barry Weiss was na were named in lawsuits. And uh, uh, when Barry Hankerson, Aaliyah's uncle, resigned as Kelly's first manager, turning the reins over to Daryl McDavid. He resigned saying Kelly needs help. He has a compulsion to pursue underage girls. The feds didn't show McDavid that letter of resignation from 2000 until their closing argument and the judge wouldn't allow it into evidence. The number of subpoenas that were not issued and testimony that was not heard and loose ends that were not followed uh, is extraordinary. And Chicago deserved better from the federal government because they arrested him in July 2019 and had three years to prepare their case. In contrast, the Brooklyn case was encyclopedic and, and, and just, just amazingly thorough. Uh, it's disappointing. But let's remember, nobody in, in history in popular music has ever been convicted of more than Kelly. Uh, he faces 10 to 90 years. He's already sentenced to 30 years in Brooklyn. Even if he only gets 10, that's life in prison for this man. Shahrazad, you were a consultant on the Lifetime documentary, Surviving R. Kelly, uh, and that series has a lot, uh, well, his attorney, R. Kelly's attorney, said that that series has a, a lot to do um, with the prosecutions, both here and New York, that we're seeing today. How important was that series? Um, and, you know, a lot of people have said that no one wanted to believe black women uh, when these allegations first surfaced in the 90s. Do you think they heard black women this time? Yeah, I want to say that um, working on that uh, on, on R. Kelly's uh, surviving R. Kelly um, was a, a very challenging uh, experience. Um, I was in charge of helping um, find counseling for some of the survivors and actually did crisis intervention at people's homes um, for some of the victims. And so firsthand got to hear the horror of these stories, right, that Jim is talking about, that he got to hear um, from the testimonies as well as um, in his book. Um, but I want to talk particularly about this, the, the, what the case in um, 2008 the, the, um, centered around this young uh, girl who was 14 at the time, um, Jane, the pseudonym Jane, uh, R. Kelly's uh, um, goddaughter, and how she wasn't um, you know, able to really testify that first time and what has shifted in the culture for her at 37 to, to be able to, to testify at this time. Um, the bravery of her and the horror that she described 
and and her testimony of uncountable times as a minor, as a as a as a minor being raped. I, I think it's really important to use that word when we talk about minors because that is the legal definition of sexual assault, right? Um, is uh, hundreds and hundreds of times, right? And how not only that occurred, but how this tape, right? Uh, uh, as we know, how often videotapes have been used now um, as evidence to really show um, some type of justice and evidence that it exists. But she and, didn't get the right to be a minor as a child. And, and that tape was in barbershops, it was in nail salons, people watched yeah. that, she was ridiculed. And so I think that, to me, that only justice that came from this moment is, is seeing and hearing her be able to be believed this time around. And I really want to focus on how do we change our culture for all of these survivors. And, and hers was, sorry to jump in, Shahrazad, because we're running out of time, yeah. but it's certainly yeah. a traumatic story. Mallory, uh, I want to get you in here one last time. In about you know 30 seconds, we heard his attorney bring up Kelly's traumatic uh, childhood um, and his own lack of, of treatment over that. What do you say to that? And is that something that should be considered at his sentencing? Well, I think it is important to note that many people who grow up to become abusers have been abused. It is the cycle of abuse that takes place. I think it's important to hold space for that for the people who come in the future, like the survivors in this case, to be heard, to be believed, and to be listened to, and to get support that they need. If it's going to be brought up in his sentencing, I think that the federal sentencing guidelines will require that it is brought up, what weight it should or should not hold. I think it's going to be left to the judge. But I think as somebody that works with survivors, I know that sexual violence and sexual harm, uh, it doesn't discriminate on race, gender, age, socioeconomic status. Anyone, unfortunately, can be a perpetrator and a survivor of this type of harm. What is the saying? Hurt people, hurt people. Uh, yeah. We'll have to leave it there. My thanks to our guests, Jim DeRogatis, Mallory Littlejohn, and Shahrazad Tillett. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Having us. And there's more Chicago tonight just ahead, so stay with us. Much of the story of Latinos in America is that of entrepreneurship. About 5 million Latino-owned businesses currently exist in the U.S. Predominantly Latino communities often bear the environmental burden of heavy industry. Residents of those communities say they have a hard time making their concerns hurt. A Chicago-based photographer has a personal understanding of immigration, and he has spent years documenting small businesses. The forces of gentrification can make people being priced out of their neighborhoods feel powerless. But the founders of Lolita's Bodega say residents have more power than they think. And there's much more ahead on the program, including calls for Chicago City Council to be downsized. But first, one of the last museums to open following the shutdown is the Hellenic Museum in Greektown. And their first show has a royal pedigree, a featured photographer and artist who is also a Greek prince. He visited Chicago for the first time, and producer Mark Vitale met him to talk mainly about his artwork, but also about his family ties to the British monarchy. The sounds of nature on a Greek summer night accompany a large-scale photograph of two olive trees on the island of Milos. I want people to come in, get fully immersed, and contemplate. I want them to forget about everything that's bothering them in their lives or even making them happy. I just want them to leave the outside world behind and, and come inside. At Chicago's Hellenic Museum, an exhibition called Resilience considers the natural world through a series of vivid abstractions. It was the pandemic project of Prince Nikolaos, son of the last king and queen of Greece. The majority of this work was created during that first lockdown in the pandemic. And so resilience was, uh, was born out of that because, first of all, the Greek people throughout the ages have been extremely resilient, be it from occupation to wars, famines, civil strife, most recently financial crisis, and lately the pandemic. But the pandemic affected the entire world. I'm just looking at it through my countrymen's eyes, the Greeks' eyes, because that's where I live and, and that's where my nation is. The almost psychedelic effect of some of these abstract photographs, including this view of the Acropolis, is due to the prince's unusual process. I had already photographed certain images, and I then printed those on aluminum, and then I immersed those in a body of water, and then I took a photograph from outside of the water to get the effect, and the effect is the refraction of the, of the colors from the bottom 
to the surface of the water. The exhibition is based on a quote by a famous Greek Nobel laureate poet called Odysseus Elitis. He said, if you deconstruct Greece, you'll be left with a vine, an olive tree, and a boat. Therefore, with these three things, you can reconstruct Greece. So I took that quote and I loosely aligned my exhibit towards that. So there's, there's a water element, there's a grape and, and wine element, there's an olive oil and olive tree element. One image is a photograph he took of the bottom of the sea. It's actually a mosaic printed on 272 pieces of recycled plastic. The prince's wife offered advice when his early efforts to capture the natural world proved frustrating. She said, don't try and capture what your eye sees. Try and capture what your soul is feeling when you see that with your eyes. And that changed everything. Prince Nikolaus is also the godson and cousin of the new King Charles III of England. We offered our condolences on the death of his aunt, Queen Elizabeth. Uh, she's been um, a tremendous person in the, in the history of the country and in the history of the world because she's witnessed and been part of so many historical events. So she will be sorely missed. I believe she'd want people to look to the, to the future and in that future you, you'll have uh, King Charles right now who I think will do a tremendous job. He's a very sensitive individual and uh, another person who's also selflessly given himself to the duty of the country and I think he'll do a marvelous job. We turned our attention back to the Prince's artwork at this, his first North American exhibition. Incredibly, he does not enhance the color on his photographs. Well, everything you see is what I saw. Everything you see is what my camera saw. What you see is what you get. You can recreate some of these colors, but the beauty is nature can provide them if you're in the right place at the right time and you're patient enough. She will de deliver. That's why I say nature is the artist. I'm just the messenger. For Chicago Tonight, this is Mark Vitale. And the National Hellenic Museum of Chicago reopens tomorrow. You can see more of Prince Nikolaus' photography on our website, where we'll also share his full comments on the late Queen Elizabeth and his godfather, King Charles. And now to Brandis. Paris, thank you. Still to come on Chicago Tonight, one-on-one -on -one with the mayor of Burr Ridge, where dozens of migrants are currently being housed after arriving in Chicago from Texas. As more older people step down from city council, we discuss the benefits and drawbacks of having a smaller city council. And an Evanston-based artist looks back at some of his life's greatest work, portraits of himself. But first, some more of today's top stories. Reverend Jesse Jackson has been discharged from Northwestern Hospital's Shirley Ryan Ability Lab. Jackson had been undergoing extensive physical, occupational, and speech therapy and getting some much-needed rest, according to a release from the Rainbow Push or Coalition, which Jackson, of course, founded. His doctor is quoted as saying the interventions focused on treating symptoms related to his Parkinson's disease. Rainbow Push says Jackson will now get back to work. Low-income Chicago residents are eligible to receive free security devices, and Chicago police hope they'll be registered with the CPD. Applicants in this now expanded program must have an income within 300 percent of the federal poverty level. That's a monthly income of just under $7,000 for a family of four. The package includes two wireless outdoor cameras and a solar-powered floodlight. Since the initial program began in June, the city says it's received 3,800 requests for reimbursement. Registering the cameras with the police department is optional. <laughs> Music fans are getting another summer festival before the season wraps up. This one for house music lovers. The Chicago House Music Festival kicked off tonight with a symposium at the University of Chicago, which will explore the history, culture, and business of the music that originated here. Then tomorrow, house music bands and DJs will play at various locations around the city. The festival includes a house club tour Saturday night and wraps up with an all-ages dance party at Millennium Park Sunday afternoon. And now to Joanna Hernandez, who spent the day in suburban Burr Ridge as part of our In Your Neighborhood series. Joanna. Thanks, Brandis. We're now here with the mayor of Burr Ridge, Gary Garasso. Thank you for joining us tonight. Now, I want to start off. There's about 16 migrants staying nearby at a nearby hotel about a mile away from here. Can you just tell me about the resources that your office is providing them at, at this point? Well, uh, there's 64 of them. They're all families, uh, no unaccompanied minors, So, uh, which we now learned uh, we haven't we didn't know in the beginning. 
Uh, we're providing them just uh, everyday uh, amenities. Uh, we, we have uh, police protection here, of course. Uh, there are many people in the village that have stepped up wanting to give food, clothing, uh, offers of employment. Uh, the school board has reached out about uh, education opportunities if any of them are going to actually stay right here in the area at the end. So we're, we're kind of everyday life now, Joanna. So there's a possibility that some of these kids will have an opportunity to be part of the schools here? Oh, sure. Public schools are open. Uh, they are here legally. That's the important thing. They're seeking asylum. Uh, and uh, if they should get their asylum and want to stay here, they, they, they can be ed educated here. And you've mentioned you visited the hotel about, twi about twice. You know, yes. Can you tell me a little bit about what you saw? Did you get a chance to speak with any people, individuals there? Uh, not too much. I'm not a Spanish speaker, and I didn't find any that were speaking English. But I will tell you that there was a group of teenage boys standing out front on Sunday. I think Sunday morning I was there, maybe Saturday morning. The days are kind of blending at this point. And I could tell what they were telling me was what a beautiful place uh, they've come. They kept clutching their hearts, uh, how thankful they were to be here. I'm sure they've come to Oz, having having traveled uh, from where they did. and. I think that they probably think this is what freedom's about. Look at this great country. And I'm really proud as the mayor of Burridge, and I know my residents are, that they're going to be able to say they started their quest for freedom in Burridge, Illinois. And what was that feeling for you as you were walking around and seeing families sitting out, you know, walking with their children, pushing their strollers? You know, what, would come, what came to mind? Two things. One, uh, they were un in an unfortunate situation, and now they're here safe. But... But to your point, Joanna, they melded in right away. It was normal things. Uh, my wife and I have raised six kids, uh, and uh, and you could see the moms with their strollers, as you said. The the teenage boys clowning around, fooling and pushing each other. You know, just just what we all do all the time. So the normalcy of it is what impressed me. Now you've expressed concerns over lack of communication from Governor Pritzker and Chicago Mayor Lori Lightfoot. Have you heard anything from either of them? Yes, I, I will tell you that I was upset with both of them. Uh, and um, after all, they put us in a very difficult position. They stood and had press conferences and they excoriated uh, Governor Abbott and anybody else who didn't give them fair notice. And, you know, they're talking about 500 people that have come here intermittently and all of a sudden. Uh, so I was very upset that they didn't afford us the same courtesies. And then for the governor in particular to call us what he called us uh, through his press secretary and then double down uh, yesterday saying we were grumbling and yet he then turns around and declares uh, an emergency and, and you know calls out the national guard for have 500 you heard from people the governor? i have not heard from the governor i sent him a pretty strong letter today uh, about all of that i heard from Lori lifewood though during the bears game on sunday she called me she apologized after a after a little bit, she's pretty feisty, you know, and she got a little feisty on the uh, on the phone with us. But it turned out to be a very professional conversation. After that, she admitted that I had every right, my residents had every right to know what was going on uh, ahead of time so we could prepare for all the normal uh, questions uh, to be answered. She then uh, called me on Tuesday and uh, wanted and followed up and wanted to know if there's anything more she could do. So I give her a little belatedly, but I give her credit. Not so much the governor. And as you mentioned, it wasn't about these individuals being here. No, it's absolutely not about that. It's the way things are handled. The same thing that they were complaining about with Abbott. When it suited their press conferences to make a strong point to show how open they were, which is fine, then be prepared. Why aren't you prepared? And what's the big deal in the long run? As I said, everything's kind of normal and quiet. These are great people. What's the big deal with 500 people? New York's got, what, 10,000, 11,000? And, Mayor, I want to quickly ask you a question. What message do you want to give the community who's concerned about migrants being here in the community? Don't be concerned. Don't be concerned at all. Uh, things are fine. Um, they're, they're searching for freedom. They want a better life. All of us are products of immigrants. And here in Burr Ridge, uh, we call it a very special place in large part because we are a very diverse community. Well, thank you so much for joining us tonight, Mayor Grasso. Thank you. And coming up, we'll speak with the local foundation and learn more about the park that we're actually standing at, Harvester Park. But first, I send it back to you. All right, Joanna, thank you. We'll see you in a bit. And now to Paris for a look at what Chicago City Council could be like with fewer seats at the table. Paris.
That's right, Brandon. It's more than a dozen older people are not seeking re-election to city council. And this sudden exodus is renewing calls to downsize the number of seats at City Hall. There are 51 council members in New York City representing 173,000 people each. Los Angeles has 15 council members representing 257,000 people each, and that's compared to Chicago City Hall, which has 50 older people representing only 54,000 people each. And joining us now with more on what cutting the size of Chicago City Council could mean are William Howell, Director of the Center for Effective Government at the University of Chicago, and Brian Giroux, Director of Policy at the Better Government Association. Welcome both of you to Chicago tonight. Uh, Professor Will Howell, the argument for reducing the size of city council, possibly cutting it in half to 25 members. Um, it's a pretty powerful argument. Look, we are a huge outlier here in Chicago in terms of the size of our city council um, relative to the population that we hold. Um, what we've done as a city is we've chopped up our, our city into 50 separate wards um, and then put in a city council with 50 members that then are uh, that all, each of whom represents those wards one at a time. We've got a whole bunch of mini mayors and in the city council, it becomes incredibly difficult to address issues that cross ward boundaries, that, that, that encourage members to, to govern with attention to the city as a whole. Um, it's a reason why there's a whole lot of, uh, it's an important reason why there's a lot of graft in our, in our politics and, and, and why um, the city council has a, such a hard time pushing back against the powers of the mayors and speaking co coherently as a group. Um, we're way out of step and, and, and something ought to be done about it. Brian Zaru, is there a major difference in public policy outcomes uh, in Chicago versus the places we mentioned, New York and L.A., where there are significantly fewer representatives uh, representing more people? I can't say if there's uh, different public policy outcomes, but I do think that the makeup of the city councils are very different. Um, as, a, as, a, as a former New Yorker, knowing how uh, New York City works. Uh, here in Chicago, as long as you're relying on ward offices to handle constituent complaints and not worrying too much about policy, uh, you can't really make the wards much bigger, I don't think. Each alderman is already handling about 50,000 people with a full staff of three. If you change up that role, you can't start looking at cutting city council, but in the grand scheme of the budget, it doesn't make a big difference. Uh, but if, you, if, the, if the jobs of the aldermen change more from administrators, city administrators to policymakers, I think there could be a big argument for it. Will Howell, the, the contrarian might say, you know, the system we have here, each person representing 50 plus thousand people tending to the, the quality of life issues, uh, it, it's better because uh, because they get more attention and, and more people know who their older person is. What about that? Yeah, I mean, I think that's the trade-off. The trade-off is that when you have greater numbers of people, you've got greater expression of local preferences, and there are goods that flow from that. So it's a really, to my mind, it's a matter of balance. Um, we as a city struggle mightily to come together as a city and the city council to recognize the entirety of the city. Um, again, it's not just the number of seats that we have. It's the fact that each member is independently elected at local uh, for, for each individual ward. You can imagine having not just uh, fewer numbers of seats, but also at least some subset of people who represent the city as a whole. Um, somehow we need to disrupt a situation in which what we see are nothing but local constituency servants um, uh, coupled with kind of symbolic gestures towards broad international issues which which the city council periodically sees fit to address but but we struggle again to come together as a city the pervasive problems involving crime and segregation um, and inadequate services and connections across um, neighborhoods is in no small part a function of the design of our city government and, and, the, and, and the, the number of people who serve in the city council is an important part of that. And it's been kind of a strong mayor, weak council kind of system. The policy is mainly emanated from the mayor's office and city council traditionally has kind of been a rubber stamp. Although I have to say the last several years I've seen more legislating done at the city council level or at least uh, an ordinance might come from the mayor and city council debates it and tweaks it like the police oversight board. But Brian Giroux, uh, does it mean that the city should take a broader look at its structure of government and not just look at downsizing city council, but, but making big changes to the whole system? Absolutely. Um, I think since 2019, we've seen more older persons trying to to take an active legislative role. The old school politics of, uh, of rubber stamping things is, is really not the way it works anymore. You look at people like Alderman Riley, Alderman Moore, 
Uh, they're trying to push for an independent parliamentarian. You look at Oldman Vasquez uh, trying to push for an independent city proposal. Uh, the more, if you look at it, the more progressive younger uh, members of city council who are coming in uh, really want to be, it sounds like they want to be legislators and less city administrators. Um, and I think that with this, this mass exodus we have of, of 15 people, I think we're going to see a big change. Community. Might be a good time to look at all that, although, Will Howell, every time we talk about downsizing city council, we have to bring up the fact that former Governor Pat Quinn, uh, several decades ago, famously passed a referendum to reduce the size of the Illinois General Assembly. The unintended consequence of that was that fewer members meant uh, power was consolidated, eventually under Mike Madigan, a lot easier. So is that an unintended consequence here? Fewer members, more opportunity for power to be consolidated? Um, look, it's there are, there are trade-offs all the way through, and whatever institutional reforms you make in one particular place, they're going to have consequences that emanate all the way through the system. A reason why the city council historically has struggled to push back against the powers of the mayor is, is that it's just incredibly difficult to govern with 50 members, all of whom are representing individual wards. Um, so when you think about the consolidation of power, the big consolidation of power that we have at the city level is at the mayoral office. So decreasing the size of the city council is not to decrease the importance or the effectiveness of the city council. It's in many ways in the service of strengthening those voices. Again, you need to think about these trade-offs, though, between attention to the interests of the city as a whole or, or larger um, uh, 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 districts and, and wards, um, as opposed to very local considerations and, and populations that if all we had were, say, at large elections, there are going to be some populations that may have a, a very difficult time getting their voices heard. So there are trade offs that run all the way through. And I know, uh, former Inspector General Joe Ferguson is uh, starting a group looking at ways to make big structural change to the city. Brian Zeru, if this is the time to do it, given the exodus, what are the ways to do that? What are the next steps? And is, is anyone in power talking about this? Uh, in power, no. I don't think anyone in power is talking about this, but I think there's a unique opportunity now. I don't think we've ever seen uh, 15 and, and maybe some more uh, over the next uh, few months, we'll find out, about 15 old sitting aldermen that are not coming back. I think this provides a phenomenal opportunity for grassroots movements to come in and uh, really try to maneuver uh, some of these younger progressives that are coming in uh, to try to change the system. And then we also should mention there are municipal elections in February. We don't know how many folks, uh, incumbents, might lose their seats. So there could be even greater turnover at city council than what we're seeing right now. But it is significant turnover at this point. And our thanks right now to Professor William Howell and Brian Zaru. Thanks so much for joining us. You bet. Thank you. And up next, we check back in with Joanna Hernandez, who's reporting live from suburban Burr Ridge. But first, we take a look at the weather. And now we check back in with Joanna Hernandez, who spent the day in Burr Ridge as part of our In Your Neighborhood series. Joanna. Thanks, Brandis. We're now here with Barbara Dorman, president of the Burr Ridge Community Park Foundation. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you, Joanna. Now, I want to start off, Barbara, tell us about your organization and why was it important to create a park foundation here in Burr Ridge? Sure. We uh, formed the actual park district in the 70s when the village was developing very rapidly because we wanted to make sure that there were parks and open spaces. Um, and then about 15 years ago, in order to support the park district, we formed the foundation. And the uh, goal was to help us keep our really low tax rate and do whatever we could to support the existing uh, park district that does a lot of programs. You know, you had mentioned that the park is kind of like the downtown of Burr Ridge. How so? Well, a lot of people, everybody comes here, and the park and its facilities are open not only to the residents, but to everybody in the area. And our park district is actually bigger than the village of Burr Ridge, so we have a lot of people all the time. You can probably hear some of them in the background. <laughs> They're still playing in the playgrounds. So tell me a little bit about this amazing playground that's right behind uh, us. Yes, I mean, it's a right. tribute to, it, it looks like a Route 66, is that correct? Absolutely, it is. That's our newest one. We are so delighted with Jim Pakanowski, the Park District's director, 
who creates these wonderful, very exciting and unique facilities. They're play facilities, but they really have a wonderful theme. And he has tried all along to depict in the play areas the history of Burr Ridge and the surrounding communities. And since Burr Ridge is on Route 66, hence the whole play area <laughs> focuses on Route 66. It's and there, really cool. It, yeah, it's wonderful. I don't know, can they see the tower from here? Probably not, but um, it's a giant climbing tower <laughs> in the form of Willis Tower. And then there are play areas developed from a roadside attractions from other parts in the states all the way over to California. So and, and, I wanna, and I wanna ask you, what makes this park so unique? What's well, so special about this park? Uh, for one thing, we welcome everybody. Everybody comes. Another thing is these uh, play areas that Jim has developed are absolutely unique. There's nothing like them anywhere and he keeps doing it. <laughs> One after the other, there are three or four depicting the entire history of the area, and we think that makes it very special. Can you tell us about some events coming up? There's one that's called Taste of Burr Ridge. Yeah, Burr Ridge. This is actually a village event this year. Uh, they did one last year. It was a lot of fun. The Park District Foundation cooperated, and we'll do it again this year. And people came out, had a good time, and we'll do it again. And Barbara, really quickly, you have been a resident here for 50 years. Yes, I have. What do you love about Burr Ridge? I just love being here. I love the open space. I love the people. It's been a wonderful place to have your family, raise your kids, and I'll stay here as long as I'm alive. Well, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me. Again, that was, again, that was Barbara Dorman. Brandis, I send it back to you. <laughs> Barbara Dorman, president of the Burr Ridge Community Park Foundation, and apparently a Burr Ridge ambassador. Joanna, uh, before we let you go, we, you spent a good part of the day reporting on these 64 migrants housed at a hotel there in Burr Ridge. Any word um, if any more migrant families are coming to Burr Ridge? You know, Brandis, when we spoke to the mayor earlier, he said he hasn't heard of any more migrants or families coming down here. But again, that, that could change, right? We could see that changing depending what happens in the next couple weeks and months. And, and, of and course, that's all we have here from Burridge. Thanks, uh, thanks, Joanne. And of course, there could be word that others are being sent to other communities in the area. Uh, if it's necessary, it's a story we'll keep watching. Up next, a series of one man's self portraits spanning 75 years. Stay with us. Don't ever miss Chicago tonight. Subscribe to our podcast. Get a daily download of our show delivered to your desktop or mobile device. Go to wttw.com slash Chicago Tonight Podcast and subscribe. Self-exploration through self-portraits. That's been the goal of Leo Segedin since he started the craft more than 70 years ago. Chicago Tonight's Jay Shevsky first introduced us to the Evanston-based artist 10 years ago. Then recently, arts correspondent Angel Ito took us to the Splains exhibit showcasing the series of self-portraits spanning 75 years. Here's another look. This is Leo Segedin. This is also Leo Segedin. This is Samir too. In fact, they're all Leo Segedin, all painted by the artist himself over the course of 75 years. But the past is my present, in my painting anyway. Jay Shevsky first introduced us to the artist in 2013. While a lot has changed since then, some things have remained the same. I grew up on the west side of Chicago, okay? Anytime I paint the city now, mm -hmm. it's from the west side of Chicago from 1940s. Despite raising his family in Evanston for the last 50 years, Segedin's work has always been rooted in his childhood memories. And while age has forced Segedin to relocate his studio space at home from the top floor to the living room on the first floor. Now I'm down here in my studio. Mm -hmm. Look at that for crying out loud. <laughs> it's a studio? <laughs> His drive remains the same. What most artists do is bullshit. Mm -hmm. Pardon the expression. Okay. Um, it, it, I think since the beginning that my paintings had to be about something. It had to have a subject, and it had to be an important subject. Mm -hmm. Those subjects are now on display in an exhibit at the Oakton Community College. What are some of your favorite self-portraits that you see in the exhibit? 
there's one that used to hang here, mm -hmm. in which I am three times. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I've seen it here every day, mm -hmm. but when I saw it in the museum, I said, wow, did I do that? One of the paintings that's in the show, actually, it shows uh, a kid with a helmet, yeah. you know, and then a old man with a beard. Mm -hmm. And that, that's me when I was a nine years old and I wanted to be a pilot. What would I think I would be, with, say, when I was 95 years old? And now that I'm 95 years old, I wonder, what did I think I was when I was a kid, you know? And I'm this confrontation. That's what the painting was about. With no help from a mirror, Segedin paints who he has always known himself to be, not necessarily who he sees. I actually have almost no memory of what I was thinking when I did them. I look at them mm -hmm. and, I, and I almost project the past into them. Segedin says he doesn't paint to please people, but hopes his work does. It's for that reason, Segedin says, he doesn't believe his style is describable. I don't think you can explain it in words. I don't think a visual image is translatable. What is it that you want viewers to take away from, from you and your work and what they interpret? Be aware of me as a person that lived for a long time, that produced, and uh, as long as I can, I will. So I may go back mm -hmm. to the more spontaneous stuff and, and just pull it out. And it'll be real loose and no edges and you know, all that. I'll see what happens. Is that intimidating? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Mm -hmm. I'm scared. Advice to young people mm -hmm. is do it where you can. Mm -hmm. There's only one material that's irreplaceable, and that's time. For Chicago Tonight, I'm Angel Ito. That exhibit has since closed, but you can still see the series of Seganins in our new exhibit at the Rare Nest Gallery in Avondale. And we're back to wrap things up right after this. Don't miss one of our stories. Get them all delivered to your desktop or mobile device with a subscription to the WTTW News Daily Briefing. Go to WTTW.com slash Daily Briefing and sign up. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by Alexandra and John Nichols, the Jim and Kay Maybe family, the Polk Brothers Foundation, and the support of these donors. And that's our show for this Thursday night. Don't forget to stay connected with us by signing up for our daily briefing. And you can get Chicago Tonight streamed on Facebook, YouTube, and our website, wttw.com slash news. <laughs> you can also get the show via podcast and the PBS video app. And please join us tomorrow night at 7 for the Week in Review. Now, for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Brandis Friedman. And I'm Paris Schutz. Thank you so much for watching. Stay healthy and safe, and we'll see you tomorrow. Mm -hmm.